Hi everybody, it's Monday again, and just as a reminder, this week we will begin uh, tapering off uh, our devotional videos uh, as we move toward the fall, uh, and so there will be devotionals prepared uh, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday of this week, and uh, the weeks to follow. Uh, the plan, at least at this point, is uh, Pastor Ken will prepare a devotional reflection on Wednesday, and I will provide something on Monday and Friday of each week. And so uh, we want to continue connecting with you. We want to continue uh, providing resources for you uh, as we uh, are able. And in the fall, we hope to make some changes and do some things differently, Lord willing. And um, we'll see what uh, our circumstances look like and we'll seek to apply whatever needs to be done. And so we, we uh, pray for your, we ask for your prayers and uh, ask that you would continue praying for your leadership here, that we would wisely move into the future and take the steps that need to be taken to continue uh, connecting with each other and building each other up as best we can using the tools that we have uh, and also that there, there might be a, a return or restoration uh, to more consistent gathering together with less limitations. We all want that, I think. Uh, today on this Monday, I have a couple of things on my mind. As often, uh, as I often have on my mind, reflecting about God and His good work in my life, uh, is His protective power. I've talked about this many times, and I'll, I think I'll be preaching uh, a psalm of protection uh, in a couple of weeks. And so I, I this is a a topic that I've talked about and I've shared that it's very close to my heart. Um, but in line with that idea of protection, um, today I want to talk about something that was, I was asked about this several weeks ago and uh, it's not the first time it's come up. And so I want to just mention it and, and look at a couple of passages and, and I really want to talk about Job for a little bit. Uh, and the way that he experienced uh, God and God's involvement in his life in those first couple of chapters of Job. We probably won't look at all of Job 1 and 2, but I want to dip in in a couple of places. And the, the particular question that I am engaging with is to think about the language of uh, a hedge of protection. Um, you know, sometimes we, we see phrases in the Bible and they get used by Christians in certain ways, uh, particularly in prayer with this, this uh, specific phrase. And it catches on and becomes uh, a, a kind of a part of our Christianese. Uh, perhaps you've heard that term before, Christianese. We, we use terms sometimes in a very specialized way uh, that is not normal conversation, uh, either, either in our context as just human beings living in western New York uh, or wherever you might be. We, we use words that we wouldn't use. We use words to talk about our relationship with God and our experience with God in a way that we wouldn't use just talking to people out in the community. Or if we do, there's no communication that happens. There's no understanding of what we're talking about. And what happens over time is that some of these phrases and some of these words become a part of our fixed idiom, if you will, our fixed language, so that there's a, a, a way Christians talk. And sometimes we use terms that we wouldn't use ordinarily. And the other thing that happens is sometimes we, we find phrases or ideas in the Bible that then become a part of the way that we talk. And sometimes we can use those phrases in a way that doesn't actually fit with the way those phrases are used in the scriptures. It's easy to do. It happens subtly over time, and it usually happens in the context of a larger community. So we hear pastors talking this way, or we read in books uh, people that we respect using these phrases, and it kind of gets stuck in our minds, and it becomes a part of how we talk. And so I want to talk about that for a few minutes. Uh, with this idea of hedge of protection. Uh, maybe you've heard the, the concept of praying a hedge of protection around someone, or maybe you've done that yourself. Uh, you've prayed a hedge of protection. So you said, God put a hedge of protection around so-and-so, 
where did that idea come from? And what are we trying to communicate? And what are we looking for? What are we expecting? Those are the questions we need to ask when these things come up. Well, the, the language of a hedge is a, it's a biblical word, a hedge of protection. You won't see that exact phrase in Scripture, I don't think, in any Bible translation that I know of. Um, but you, you do see the word hedge used in certain contexts. And we don't have a lot to look at, frankly. We have basically two passages, uh, maybe a third one that, that sometimes could be brought into the discussion to talk about this. But let me just frame this for you the way that I've read it in books and the way that I've heard it in my experience over the years just interacting in different churches and with different groups of people. Sometimes someone will pray a hedge of protection around someone and the expectation is, it seems, that when they do that, it, it praying a hedge of protection has a certain unique spiritual power that if, if you pray a hedge of protection around someone, then it's like, um, it's extra powerful and it's extra protective. So that a hedge of protection is what you pray when you're concerned that uh, the devil particularly may be involved in what you are doing. And, uh, and so, and I think the reason that that, the, the main reason that that is uh, often the context when we use that language is because uh, the language of a hedge is used in the story of Job in the op opening couple of chapters. And, and so it, it has, there is a connection between uh, Satan in the story and this word hedge appears and it does seem to be in the context of, the, of a kind of protective measure that God has put in place. Uh, that's the, the main reason I think that it's caught attention for some people. And I'll, I'll, we'll look at that in just a moment from the book of Job. But if you think a little bit further and you just process what you're, what you're saying, you're, you're taking a, a, a phrase, uh, really a metaphor, which we'll talk about in just a minute, but an image, and you're suggesting that if you pray that way, and when you pray that way, there's a special power that God exercises in response to that kind of prayer that he doesn't exercise at other times. So that if you pray this, for some people at least, it seems like they have a greater expectation or greater confidence that God's actually going to do it. That God's actually going to protect the person from satanic oppression or satanic opposition or hindrance in their ministry. And I, I just want to question that whole idea before we actually look at the biblical texts and see what they say and what they don't say. Because the reality is this, again, you get two passages, maybe a third passage where this idea is even possibly relevant. In the rest of the Bible, you don't see that language being used. You see lots of prayers that God would protect someone in simple language. We looked at one yesterday in Psalm 16. David just prays, protect me, guard me, preserve me, O God. And that's the most common thing that you see. There are other metaphors that are used in Scripture for protection. We saw another one in Psalm 16, taking refuge in God, viewing God as this tower that you climb up into so that your enemies can't reach you, can't get to you, because he's protecting you. There are actually a lot of images or metaphors in the Scriptures for how God protects his people. There's the metaphor of the shield. There's the metaphor of the, uh, uh, the army. That, that God uh, is the Lord of hosts, the God who commands the armies, and he brings his armies to bear to protect his people. He brings his armies to fight against our enemies. And, and so there are lots of images that we could draw on, but fundamentally we need to remember that the protection for God's people is a part of God's covenant with us. He has promised to protect us. And so... When we ask God to protect us, we're asking him to do what he's already promised to do. And so when we pray, we, we should be careful with our expectations because what can happen is, is we think that God cannot or does not 
act in certain ways unless we pray in certain ways. And I've tried to show repeatedly and in different ways that that is not the case. It's just not the case, experientially or biblically. God is not dependent on our prayers. God is not dependent on anything in us to act a certain way. He does good in our lives because he's committed to do good in our lives. Now, he calls us to pray, and the beauty of it all is he delights to answer our prayers. He delights to act for our good in our lives in response to our prayers. That's a part of our relationship with God. But don't think that that's the only time that he does good in your life. And don't think that he won't protect you if you don't ask him to. And that's, if you think about it from a father-son relationship or a parent-child relationship, that's just the silliest thing ever, isn't it? I mean, do you wait for your kids to ask you to keep them safe? Do you wait for your kids to, to ask you to come in and save them when they're in danger? No, of course not. You jump in when you see danger. You intervene. That's how God works. Now, he does. Again, he delights when we express our dependence on him by asking him. But he is in no way waiting for us to do anything. We shouldn't view God as sitting around waiting for us in any way before he's going to act. He's not waiting for us to get our act together. He's not waiting for us to figure things out. He's not waiting for us to ask. He doesn't need our permission to do anything. And so we have to be careful about our expectations. And that comes into this praying in connection with this idea of a hedge of protection. And so I want to talk about that from the scriptures for a few minutes. I'll show you the passages where the language of hedge comes up. And I think if you just look at the passages, you'll see that there's no basis for this idea of asking God to provide this. In none of these contexts do you see prayer at all. And so it's interesting that we've developed this idea of asking God or praying a hedge of protection around someone because the Bible doesn't do that. It just doesn't. And so let's see what the scripture says, okay? So... We're looking at basically three passages. Let me bring in uh, the, the least relevant one first. And um, I guess I can set this down. It's in front of me here on my screen. So um, the first one is uh, Hosea chapter 2, verse 6. Okay, so you could look that up if you'd like. Um, this language of hedge is used there. And I've seen in some books people pointing to this as an example of this, but this is exactly not what's going on. Uh, so through the prophet Hosea, God says, Therefore I will hedge up her way with thorns, and I will build a wall against her, so that she cannot find her paths. This is God speaking through the prophet, announcing judgment against his people for their rebellion and their idolatry. This is not a hedge of protection. This is a hedge that imprisons. This is, so when you see the word hedge, don't, you need to get a literal picture in your mind first and foremost before you can understand the metaphor, before you can understand the image. He's talking about a thorn hedge. So like a, a, he, a thorny hedge, a thorn bush. And in this context, it's an act of judgment. So. Israel, if you think about it, just let's think historically for a minute, Israel wants to worship other gods. And God doesn't want them to worship other gods. God wants to punish them for their desire and their act of worshiping other gods. And so what Hosea uses is this image as God announces the judgment that's coming and he says, I'm going to surround you with a, hedge, a thorn hedge. So I'm going to put thorns around you. It's, think about it like this. It's like how a prison has chain link fence and barbed wire around it. That's to prevent people from escaping and if they try to escape they're pricked, they're stabbed, they're harmed. That's what's going on in this passage, Hosea 2, very clearly. God's announcing judgment through the image of the hedge of thorns. And so a hedge there is not a good thing, it's not a protective measure, it's meant to bring judgment against them. It's an act of punishment to restrain them and ultimately to inflict judgment upon them. And so it's very inappropriate to bring that verse into the picture with this idea of a hedge of thorns. Now, there's one other passage outside of Job that is perhaps relevant 
um, Isaiah 5, 5. Um, and it, 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 it's a negative picture. It's also an announcement of judgment against the people, against God's people. And it says, it's a part of, Isaiah 5 is this beautiful poetry. Uh, and it's the song of the vineyard, where uh, God is depicting his people as a vineyard. So this is the southern kingdom, Judah. This is Jerusalem. And, and God is depicting them as uh, a vineyard. And he is saying he is going to bring judgment of, against his vineyard because it has produced no fruit for him. It's produced wild fruit. It's produced uh, sour grapes and that idea. And so he says, and so again, this is poetry. This is imagery. This is a metaphor. This is a, an image. So think, paint the picture in your mind. Uh, the Lord says through Isaiah, and now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge and it shall be devoured. I will break down its wall, and it shall be trampled down. I will make it a waste. It shall not be pruned or hoed, and briars and thorns shall grow up. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. So, the picture is of God's people, Judah, being a vineyard that has a, a row of hedges, as a wall that encloses or encircles the vineyard. And there the image is a protective idea. So the image is uh, that God, when he planted the vineyard, he also planted these hedge rows that would encircle the vineyard to keep animals from coming in, to keep uh, even to, to hinder people from coming in to steal the produce and the harvest. And so this is a picture here of God's protection. And here he's saying a part of the judgment is I'm going to take away your protection. So the, the, the image here is of removing the protective power of God. He's going to allow wicked people to come in and destroy Judah. So think about the, the meaning of the metaphor. He's going to simply allow and actually bring in the forces of Babylon to come in and destroy Judah and Jerusalem and the temple. They're going to slaughter people. They're going to kill Jewish people. They're going to take the ones that survive into exile. They're going to rape and pillage. They're going to destroy the land. They're going to destroy the temple. They're going to tear down the walls of the city. That's the image that's being portrayed here. That's the reality that's being portrayed here by this image of a vineyard who God is pictured as the vine owner, the vineyard, the, the, the gardener who comes in and chops down all the hedges and burns them so that enemies and wild animals can come in and eat the fruit. So it's simply a statement of judgment that says God is going to remove his protective power from you. That is a sad, sad reality. But for you and for me as Christians, if you're a follower of Jesus, that will never happen to you. That will never happen to you. Period. God's commitment to you in the new covenant is everlasting and eternal. And he will never, never, never remove his protective power from you. Period. <laughs> so there's no fear here that God is going to abandon us the way that he abandoned the people of Israel, the people of Judah, in judgment for their idolatry. He will never do that to us because of our connection to Jesus Christ, his son. He cannot. He abandoned Jesus. He removed his protection from Jesus on the cross so that he will never remove his protective power from us. And so we have a rock-solid guarantee in the New Covenant that he will never remove the hedge from around us. He will always, always, always act to protect us. Now, again, what does that mean? What is our expectation? Does that mean you won't get sick? Does that mean you won't experience hardship and tribulation in this life? Absolutely not. 
God protects us in those hard situations. God ensures that even when pressure, the pressure of tribulation, if you remember the word tribulation in the New Testament and the Old Testament equivalent means pressure, literally, squeezing, crushing. And so the promise is and the guarantee is that even though we will go through tribulation, we will go through these pressured times where we're squeezed and crushed even, the guarantee is we will not be destroyed. We will not be destroyed under God's judgment the way that Judah and Israel were because of what Jesus has done. That cannot happen to us. And so we will go through hardship. We will lose in this life. We will suffer. That's been promised to us also. Jesus was very clear about that and the apostles were equally clear that we must go through tribulation to enter the kingdom of God. We must in this world and we will but the promise is is that Jesus walks with us through the suffering we share in the sufferings of the Messiah even as we go through tribulation and so the the guarantee is that we will endure and we will survive even if it kills us even if it kills us you remember that that when Jesus is talking to his disciples and he's warning them about what they're going to face and the persecution they're going to, they're going to experience. He warns them about all of that and then he says, but not a hair of your head will perish. And he just told them that they're going to kill you, but not a hair of your head will perish. <laughs> it's one of the most quizzical things that Jesus ever said perhaps, but it's very clear that what he means is he is preserving your life even if you lose your physical life. And so this idea of protection is very important and it's guaranteed, but that doesn't mean that we won't experience bodily, real, deep, emotional suffering in this world. We will, but the promise is, and the protection that comes, is that we will be able to survive, endure, and even have that suffering, that pain, that loss redeemed and good will be brought from it. Those are the promises that come from this idea of protection. So, the image is appropriate in one regard, but we need to think very carefully about it as Christians. Now, let's go to Job and consider what we're looking at here. So, Job chapter 1. I'm going to grab my Bible here to look at some of the context more clearly. Job chapter 1. You remember the story. I'm not going to read all of the details. Uh, Job is introduced to us as a very, very wealthy and prosperous man with a large family, ten children, excuse me, and uh, lots and lots of resources. And then we're, we're introduced to a scene in heaven. Okay, so there's a scene in heaven where angelic figures, they're called the sons of God here, angelic figures come before God, and it seems to be a very common thing. And Satan, or the Satan, I think I talked about this when we looked at Zechariah 3 a few months ago uh, in one of our devotional reflections, but this is the same idea. The Satan, the prosecuting attorney, comes with the sons of God. He is a member of God's court. He is the prosecuting attorney. And so he has a place there in the heavenly council, in the heavenly court. He is not out of place in this story. He is functioning as he should function, sort of. But he's twisted the good purpose of a prosecuting attorney. He wants to use his power and his authority that God has granted to him as the heavenly prosecutor to turn on the judge and to show that the judge is unjust. That's what Job is really about. Job's story, set up this way, is not to put Job and his righteousness on trial, but it's actually putting the judge on trial. And so when Satan comes, he has this interesting conversation with Yahweh the judge. And so you can see it uh, if you pick up in Job 1, uh, 7. Yahweh said to Satan, from where have you come? And Satan answered Yahweh and said, From going to and fro on the earth, and from walking up and down on it. Now, from that description, we don't know anything about what Satan was really up to. It just says he was on the earth, rather than in heaven, and he was running around, observing, 
That's all it tells us. Doesn't say he was doing anything malicious. Doesn't say he was out there tempting people. Doesn't say he was out there sowing discord and dissension. Maybe he was. But it doesn't say that. It just says he was running around on the earth. And there's no condemnation or questioning about that from Yahweh. It seems like that's what he does and that's what he's supposed to do, sort of. So then, then, verse 8, And Yahweh said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? Now, this is something that I think we forget sometimes when we think about the story of Job. God brings Job up. God is the one who puts a target on Job's back. He does. He brings him up to the adversary, the accuser, the prosecuting attorney here. So, I think from that we can infer that Satan was observing people on in the world and... God singles out one man individually and says, "Have you? Did you, in your comings and goings around the earth, did you happen to see Job? Did you happen to see Job? Have you considered my servant Job that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil? So God assesses Job here as blameless and upright. And the key is in the middle of this description. Blameless and upright, and then the central piece is that he fears God. So how is it that Job is an, a, a blameless and upright man who turns away from evil? He fears God. He's got a right relationship with God. He uh, understands and embraces who God has revealed himself to be. Now, it's hard to tell exactly when Job lived. Okay, this is, this is a historical story. It's laid out as a history here. And other parts of Scripture point back to this as Job being a historical figure. But it's hard to tell exactly when Job might have lived. Uh, many suggest he might have lived before Abraham. And that is quite possible. And so, God singles this man out and identifies him as one who fears God. Now, that's a key thought in wisdom literature in the Old Testament. We've talked about that some as we've looked at Proverbs. Uh, and it comes up in Ecclesiastes, of course, and, uh, and, and so he is, he's got a right relationship with the true God, one of the very few, especially if we're talking about before Abraham. And so how did he come to that? Well, he's, he, he has received revelation from God somehow so that he has, in, has recognized that and embraced it. He has seen God as he really is, holy and awesome, and he's, he's, he's received that, believed it, and embraced it and said, yes, I want that God. I want to be in relationship with that God, and he has been. And because of that, he is blameless and upright, and he turns away from evil. And so he's introduced here, the prosecuting attorney then, if you think about it, a prosecuting attorney looking at somebody to accuse, this would be a challenge for him. If he's blameless and upright and he turns away from evil, then how can he be condemned, is the idea. And so God brings him into the discussion, and then here's what happens. And so Satan answered, this is verse 9, Job 1, 9, Then Satan answered Yahweh and said, Does Job fear God for no reason? And we could translate that a little bit more careful, or more literally, more transparently, if you will. Does Job fear God with no pay? With no pay. Think about that. Satan is suggesting already, and he raises questions. This is just like what he does in the Garden of Eden, right? When he approaches Eve, he tries the same thing on God. <laughs> That's not going to go very well for him. But he tries the same thing. He raises these questions to try to challenge the authority and the assessment of God. Does Job, does Job fear God for no reason, without pay? And so he's, he's implying, and notice how subtle he is. He's subtle in the garden with Eve, initially at least, before he gets real direct. But notice here that he even very, tries to be very subtle against God. Does Job fear God without any payment? Doesn't Job have some incentive? And so the whole question on the table for Job is, is his blamelessness, is his turning away from evil, is it genuine or is it motivated by a desire for personal gain? Is it self-centered? Is it incentivized?
in a wrong way, in a way that nullifies the goodness of what he does. If he's out just for payment, if he fears God just because God does good things for him, then there's something wrong with both Job's righteousness and also with God's rewarding of him. And that's really what's on the table here. This is not really about Job. This is about God. Satan is raising a very subtle question about God's policy of blessing people in this world and blessing them in their righteousness. And so he's recognizing what we read in Proverbs so frequently, that God does good and blesses the righteous person. You even see this in the Mosaic Law, right? There are blessings promised for obedience. And Satan is raising a question about that. Is it right for you to do that? Because then, don't you set up a system, God, don't you set up a system that way where the only reason people do good is so that they can get good stuff from you. And so, isn't that a bad system? Aren't you a bad God for creating a system that works that way, for treating people that way, for relating to people that way? Uh, there's no genuine concern for righteousness for righteousness sake and for obedience for obedience sake there's always going to be this self-centered uh, reward motivation that the accuser here suggests is off base and then verse 10 is where we get the language of a hedge so again he's questioning the judge here have you not put a hedge around him and his house and all that he has on every side. You have blessed the work of his hands and his possessions have increased in the land. So the uh, prosecuting attorney here is making an observation. He is observing and he's making an interpretation of the situation, right? He's, he's saying, you have protected Job. So again, there is this language of a hedge. He's using a metaphor, saying Job and his family and his stuff, his resources, his animals, all that he has, you have ensured that it's prospered. So he's saying you have protected Job from harm. And that's why, that's why he fears God and praises you. That's why he seeks to obey you because you've preserved his resources. You've preserved his life and his family. And here comes the challenge. This is where he lays down the gauntlet. Verse 11. But stretch out your hand and touch all that he has and he will curse you to your face. This is not very subtle from the prosecuting attorney here. Now he is directly instigating the problem that we'll read about in the next chapter, in the next section. And notice the response from the judge. You think this surprised God? You think this took him off guard? God brought Job to the prosecuting attorney's attention. God has much bigger purposes in what we read about in the next section and on in chapter 2 that even the accuser or the prosecuting attorney can recognize at this point. God is the one who's driving the ship here. Notice the response in verse 12, And Yahweh said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your hand. Only against him do not stretch out your hand. So Satan went out from the presence of Yahweh. Now, Satan has essentially challenged God to remove the protection from him. Remove the protection that you've provided and see what, how Job responds. And what unfolds is very interesting and needs to be read very carefully. There is a tension here and an ambiguity that is unclear at this point. Because Satan says to God, stretch out your hand and touch, meaning harm, all that he has, and he will curse you to your face. That's the challenge. 
But then God says to Satan, all that he has is in your hand, Satan. And then don't stretch out your hand against him personally, against his body. What unfolds? You know the story. He uh, receives messengers on several occasions that tell what happens to his resources and then to his children. Notice the way the first episode unfolds. Marauders, Sabians, foreigners came in and killed servants and um, took the oxen. That's the first thing. So enemy people came in, and so that's evidence that the, the protection, the hedge is gone. Right, it's the same image from Isaiah five. When the the protection is gone, then the Babylonians can come in and destroy Judah and Jerusalem. And so it is here that the protection is gone, and so these marauders can come in and they take the oxen and they kill most of the servants. But then another servant comes, and about all the sheep and the servants who were watching the sheep, the sheepherders, the shepherds. Notice the way the servant says it. Verse 16, while he was yet speaking, there came another and said, The fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I alone have escaped to tell you. Now, think about that for a moment. Who controls the fire of God? The fire of God is probably a... They're pro I mean, again, they're looking and they are... Um, looking and they saw lightning, probably. Lightning struck all the sheep and killed them and struck the shepherds and killed them. Who controls the lightning? Does Satan control the weather? Do you see any evidence in the Bible that Satan can control the weather? I don't. They were right to describe it as the fire of God. The third group comes, the third servant comes and the Chaldeans, which is Babylonians, actually, um, they come in and they uh, killed uh, more servants, took his camels, and then finally, finally, the last servant comes, the fourth servant, and tells him of the death of his children. And how did that happen? Verse 19, Behold, a great wind came across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house, and it fell upon the young people, and they are dead. And I alone have escaped to tell you. Who did? Who did this? Who did these things to Job? To Job's resources and to Job's children? Ultimately, God did. Now, there is some ambiguity here, because Satan said... Yahweh says to Satan, they are in your hand. But the challenge was that God would stretch out God's hand against Job. And so whether, whether you want to think theologically about this and recognize that at some level, this is all a part of God's plan because God allowed Satan to do this. If you want to think about it like that, that's fine. But I'm suggesting to you that Job chapter 1 suggests that at least in round 1, God did this. God's power did this to Job and to his children. That is a very hard thing to wrestle with when you recognize that reality. But notice Job's response. That's the key thought here at the end of Job 1. And Job arose and tore his robe shaved his head, and fell on the ground, and worshipped. And he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. Yahweh gave, and Yahweh has taken away. Blessed be the name of Yahweh. So from Job's perspective, even, he knows nothing of Satan. He knows nothing. Through the whole book, he has no idea about Satan or any kind of angelic involvement in his experience. 
from Job's vantage point, his interpretation of his experience is that God has done this. And I think we need to side with Job here and recognize with all of the pain and with all of the difficulty, we don't want to join up with Job's friends who question and they put the blame all on Job. You must have sinned, because again, they don't know anything about Satan's involvement, and they don't have a clear understanding. It's very clear as you read what they say. They don't have a clear understanding of God's involvement either. They see God as punishing Job for what he must have done. But for us, for most modern readers, if you read chapter 1 carefully, and you see God as the primary actor, and you see Job's perspective that God did this, outrage and confusion comes for much of, for many people when they read this and they actually pay attention to the details. And we get angry with God or question God, how could you do this to someone? And this is where the book of Job finds its place as a wisdom book in the Old Testament. It is God's wisdom that is so much higher than our wisdom that's on display here. God has a great purpose in what he's doing in all of this. And by the end of the book, you see that purpose, but it doesn't answer all the questions. It didn't for Job, and it doesn't for us as readers. But it becomes very clear that God was seeking to show his character, to reveal himself more clearly as a God who was loving and gracious and merciful and compassionate. That's the language James used when he read Job. Under the inspiration of the scriptures, he recognized that the story of Job was meant to teach us about the mercy and compassion of God. As the end of the story comes, and God restores Job, but more than that, more than that, God was with Job through this experience. God enabled Job to endure this as he did, even as he struggled and suffered and questioned and argued and wanted to be shown to be innocent given the accusations that were coming against him from his friends. The final word on the matter in verse 22, in all this, Job did not sin or charge God with wrong. So, did God remove the hedge of protection from Job? No, he did not. Instead, he allowed Job and he, he applied pressure to Job. He walked Job through a period of intense and deep suffering for his good purposes. And Job came out better on the other side. Not only as God graciously and freely granted him more resources than he had before, and ten new children. Now, for anybody who's ever lost a child, you know that having another child doesn't replace the one that was lost. And I'm sure that was the case for Job. The fact that he, got, he had ten more children doesn't replace the ten that he lost. But instead, if you think about it and you recognize that his children, his adult children, may have been God-fearers with him, then in eternity, in the resurrection, he has 20 children. All that to say, going back to this idea of protection, it doesn't look like we think all the time. Satan challenged uh, God, suggesting that God had preserved him from harm and preserved him from suffering, and that's why Job was righteous. And God showed and proved that that is not true. Job refused to charge God with wrong in this, even though he recognized that God did this. Do you see that? Job believed that God is the one who took his children and took his resources through these enemy raiders and through the lightning from heaven. Job believed God did it. And Job was able to say, God was not wrong to do that. That suggests to me that God 
was still at work preserving Job's perspective and preserving Job's relationship with himself. And so it becomes a powerful picture of God's protection in the midst of suffering and hardship and loss. Now, I've gone longer than I intended to. I like this story, and I I really love the reality that it teaches. But notice, again, the language of a hedge is used as a metaphor for God's protection, but nowhere are we instructed to pray for such a thing. Nowhere do we see anybody asking God to do that. Job will actually use the language in his first reflection in chapter 3. I think it's his first reflection. Um, when he laments his, the day of his birth and he is beginning his complaint and his friends are simply still listening. And he uses the language in Job 3.23. Why is light given to a man whose way is hidden, whom God has hedged in? And he doesn't mean that positively. He, given the suffering that he experienced in round two, now that his body has been afflicted, and there we do see Satan directly involved in the affliction of his body, which is a common thing that Satan is able to do in the world, afflict people with sickness and harm physically. The things in chapter one, Satan, he could be involved with the Chaldeans and the Sabians raiding, but he cannot be involved. He doesn't control the lightning or the wind. But in chapter 2, he specifically is said to strike Job with these sores that he has. And so Job, there again, he has no knowledge that it's Satan or some other entity doing this. His assumption still, even, must be that God is doing this. And in his lament, in his grieving of what's happened to him, he sees that God has done this, whom God has hedged in. And it's the verbal form of the noun we saw in chapter 1, hedge. And, and the idea is he, he feels like we saw in Hosea 2 that God has put this hedge of thorns around him so that he can't move and he can't go about. He feels fenced in, not in, protect, not in the sense of being protected from harm, but in the sense that he, he's trapped in this. And so... We have no basis, biblically, to pray for a hedge of protection. And we certainly have no biblical basis for thinking that a hedge is somehow some powerful protection that prevents satanic opposition. That's not the point in chapter 1. I mean, we ought to be suspicious a little bit that that word and that, that idea comes out of Satan's mouth. right? He's questioning God. Haven't you put a hedge around him? Haven't you protected him? And there's some truth in it, but... Given that it's coming out of Satan's mouth, we ought to say, okay, that's not entirely true. We should assume, I think, that Job has experienced some measure of suffering in his life. Everybody does. Everybody faces some kind of suffering. I mean, even the anxiety that he expresses about his children, that he offers sacrifices for them every day because he's so worried about them, that's a form of suffering. Right, parents? And so... We shouldn't trust what Satan says here, that God has put some kind of protective hedge around him. That means that Job has never suffered. Um, Job is a man who lived in this world, lived a long time, had lots of kids. And if you, if you have lots of kids, if you even have one kid, I have one kid, and I, I feel like I've been suffering for four years in a new way. And if you have lots of kids, that just multiplies it, doesn't it? I mean, that's the, that's the promise of the curse in Genesis 3. It's not just for mothers that are pain, sorrow will be multiplied in childbearing. It's not just about the birth process, which is physically painful, but it's about the child rearing, which is painful in all kinds of ways for both mommy and daddy. And so, anyway, I'm rambling. So, let's not pray. <laughs> let's not pray for hedges of protection around people, but let us instead affirm the reality that in the new covenant, in our connection to Jesus, we are eternally secure. We are protected. God is committed to protecting us. And it's right to ask him to protect us because he's promised to do that. And it's right to ask him to protect us from physical harm. But we need to recognize that he may say no to that request. And that doesn't mean that he's not protecting us and keeping us safe. The times that he allows or brings into our lives physical suffering, he does so as a part of his great wisdom and his larger purposes to do us ultimate good and to bring himself the most 
good. We won't understand how that is working at all times, especially when we're in the midst of it. But let that be our faith. Let us trust the Word of God that tells us so clearly that He is committing a, committed to keeping us safe from harm and specifically from satanic harm. Christians should not be concerned, overly concerned about satanic opposition. Jesus himself is committed to protecting us. And whatever Satan does, and whatever he is allowed to do, he is allowed by God to sift us occasionally. But not to the point that our faith will fail. You remember, Jesus told Peter what he knew. Peter had no way to know this, but Jesus knew. Satan had requested to sift Peter like wheat. What does that mean? We wanted to run Peter's soul through a sieve, a strainer, if you will, from the kitchen, so that there would be nothing left of Peter's faith. But Jesus' response was, but take heart. I have prayed for you, Peter. I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And I believe given what we see in John 17, Jesus' high priestly prayer, that he has prayed that kind of prayer for every one of us, every one of his followers, every one of God's children throughout history are under the protection of Jesus. And his protection is solid. Much more than a hedge um, is solid. Jesus is the one who protects us from harm. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for your protection. Thank you for the safety and the security that we will experience forever and ever. Thank you that you have the power to keep us from harm, from all dangers. And thank you that even when we experience pain and difficulty in this world, it's not outside of your purposes, it's not outside of your hand, and you use even the hardships that we face for our good and for your glory. So let us rejoice, let us give you thanks, and let us place our faith deeply and solidly in your protective power for us. In Jesus' name we pray.